So we introduced the concepts of hash functions. We now want to look at how we can use them to authenticate. And we'll start by a set of examples. So just to remind you, so far we've said for a hash function, a cryptographic hash function, we take we need the requirements that it's a one-way function. It has this one-way property. You can hash a message and get the hash value. So apply the function on the message, get a hash value. That should be easy. But to take just the hash value and find the original message, that should be hard. So one way only. Finding the original message just from the hash should be practically impossible. So we need a function with this requirement. Or that meets this property. Uh, another property. No collisions. You hash two messages, you get two different hash values. So we'll, we'll see some examples of why those properties are important when we use them for security. But we said in practice, this one's not true. Because the number of messages is always, well, not always, with all the practical hash functions functions we use, the hash value is short, say 128 bits. But the message may be long and longer than the hash value. So therefore the number of possible messages is going to be larger than the number of possible hash, hash values. Therefore if a hash function maps a message to a hash value, some messages must map to the same hash value. So we, in theory, we'll have collisions in practice, we need it to be hard for an attacker to find collisions. Let's look at how we can use hash functions for authentication. And we'll go through three examples here, showing different, different uses of hash functions. <coughs> this example A, we have a message we want to send from A to B and we want to make sure that B can authenticate. Well, we've seen in the previous topic that we can use symmetric key encryption to authenticate. Encrypt, and then we decrypt. If we decrypt successfully, it means the message is authentic. But that relies on the decryptor to know, or to be able to recognize the structure. We said the assumption was that when we decrypt a message, we can recognize that this is the plain text. It's not something uh, which is not the plain text. Now, in this example, we are effectively using the hash function to add structure to the message. So what we do is we take the message, calculate the hash of the message, get the hash value, and then combine them together. So concatenate the message and the hash value and then encrypt everything with a shared secret key, shared with B. And we send that ciphertext to B. B decrypts. So B receives a message, thinks it's from A. From address is A. Therefore decrypt with a key that is shared with A. When we decrypt, we get as an output if we use the right key and now nothing's been modified, we get the message and the hash value. So to authenticate, B checks the hash of the message, compare it with the hash value received. We use the same approach in Mac using Mac authentication. We send the message and the tag to, to verify the receiver. We calculate the Mac of the message and compare it to the tag. Here, same concept. Receive the message and the hash value to verify, calculate the hash of the message and compare to the hash value received. And if they match, we assume everything's okay. If they don't match, something's gone wrong. Don't trust the message. The, the role of the hash function in this example is just to provide structure to the message. Remember, we need to be able to make sure that the message is the correct plain text when we decrypt, and that's what the hash function does here. Because if we decrypt with the wrong key, why would that happen? 
Well, if the message came from someone pretending to be A and didn't have the key shared between A and B, then we decrypt with a key which wasn't used to encrypt. Then we get some output, and the output would be different than the message and the hash value. It would be, be able to detect that it's different because of the different key in that case. So if someone masquerades as A in this case, the keys will be different. Use a C, I'll not draw it, but use a C sends. They don't have a secret key K. If someone modifies the message, again, if they modify the message, then when we decrypt and compare the hash, those values will be different. And that's used for our verification. So this one is providing structure in our message, but also using symmetric key encryption. Now we don't normally need to use symmetric key encryption all the time. Sometimes we don't want the message to be confidential, or we don't need the message to be confidential. And because encryption of the entire message takes time, we often want to authenticate the message without providing confidentiality. And that's what this example does. We take the message to send to B. I don't care if someone sees the message, but I care that B can be certain that no, no one's modified the message. So I calculate the hash of the message and encrypt the hash of the message with key K, a shared secret key between A and B. Concatenate the message with the encrypted hash value, send and verify. Verify at the receiver B. And again, verification is hash of the received message compared with the hash generated by the source, the hash received. If they match, everything's okay. If not, don't trust it. Let's look and see what an attacker can do on this scheme. So what happens if the attacker tries to modify something along the way or if they try and pretend to be someone else? and see how this provides authentication. And we'll try and draw it again and see what the attacker can do. And what are the general ways for an attack to take place? Anyone's suggestions? Suggest an, an attack. And we'll show whether it works or not. No need to be correct, just a suggestion. Sorry? Modify the message, good. So if as an attacker, A sends a message to B, if you can intercept, modify the message, and then forward it on to B, and if B doesn't know it was modified, then you've been successful in an attack. You've modified the message without it being detected. So that's what we want to do as the attacker, modify the message. So let's try. What do we start with? Uh, so A is going to send a message to B and we have a message we have the hash of that message let's call it lowercase h is the hash of M so A calculates that and then A encrypts that lowercase h, that hash value. And let's say it's C we get from encrypting with a shared secret key, K A B, lowercase h. That's what we do at user A. That is a message take the hash of the message and the result of that we encrypt with a shared secret key and now we're going to send the message and that encrypted value concatenated together so let's send them Sorry. so we send in this case M, 
M concatenated with C. I've just used C because that's the output of the encryption here. The message and the encrypted hash value. We send that. But our malicious user intercepts. Before it gets to B, they intercept and do some modifications. So our malicious user, Mao, he intercepts and tries to first modify the message. So intercepts and sends to B a modified message, so he calculates M prime. Actually, Mal gets this new message, which he wants to send to B, M prime, and sends M prime and the original C. to B. So there's the attack and now we need to see if if B can detect the attack or not. Now how do you modify a message along the way? Well we haven't looked too much about the practical parts but let's say A and B are communicating across the internet. So B is in the US, A is here in Thailand. When we send our data across the internet, it goes via a set of routers which are owned and operated by different internet service providers. So A sends it to his local ISP in Thailand, which sends it through an ISP that connects to uh, up to Japan, which then goes across the Pacific to uh, the west coast of the US and then to the destination. So the data traverses through many different organizations' networks. So, who is Mao? The malicious user is someone who, somewhere between A and B, can intercept the packets being sent and modify them. What's an example? Maybe Mao is a, a rogue employee of an internet service provider, so an ISP, the malicious user is some employee who has access to the routers. So, in effect, he can see everything sent through his internet service provider and, in this case, even modify it. So, the malicious user modifies the message, sends the message, the new message, but the C value unchanged. Now we try to authenticate. So B follows its normal steps. We receive a message and we receive a C value. And to make it a bit clearer, I'll denote the values received by M, let's denote them as MR, that's an R, combined with CR. R for received. So B receives some message, let's call it MR, combined with some encrypted hash value, CR. What we need to be sure is that MR, the received message by B, should be the same as the, the message sent by A, M. That's what B wants to be sure. If it's not, then it's a problem. So what it does to verify Decrypt. It decrypts using KAB. Why KAB? Because B thinks it came from A, therefore uses a key shared between A and B. He decrypts that C value received. And let's get it, let's say the result is HR. 
it will be a hash value, or it should be. Because in fact, what was encrypted, a hash value was encrypted to get C. So what we'd expect when we decrypt C, we get a hash value. So I'll denote it as HR. And the next step B takes is to calculate the hash of MR, the message received. And compares. That is, compares HR with the hash of MR. I haven't shown it very well, but this is, compare these two values. Are they the same? If so, trust the message. If not, don't trust. Are they the same? If you're B, do you trust the message? Let's check. H of MR, so we've got the hash of MR. And HR, which is decrypt using KAB of CR. What was CR? C was, the C value was not modified. So we know, now I know that CR, the C received, is the same as the C sent. It wasn't changed along the way. So in fact, CR is the same as C. The reason I gave it a different name because initially B doesn't know if it is the same. So I just try and distinguish. When B receives a message, it doesn't know whether it's the same as what A sent. So instead of using the same notation, I use the CR to mean it's different. But now I know that in this system, CR is the same as C. It wasn't modified. Therefore, when we decrypt CR with KAB, CR was this C. And we're going to get lowercase h. So let's continue here. Let's write it longer. HR. I'll repeat. And given that the C value did not change, that means CR is actually C. And what is C? If we look on the left side here, C is the encrypt of KAB of H. So decrypt, I'm just doing a replacement. Replace C with encrypt of KAB of H. What do we get? If we decrypt something, again using symmetric key encryption, decrypt something with KAB that was in, encrypted using KAB, then we get the original plain text. Plain text H encrypted with KAB gets ciphertext. Ciphertext decrypted with KAB gives us the original plain text. So the output is H, lowercase h. That's a H, not an N. So, this value here is lowercase h. And what was lowercase h? How was h calculated? Well, the hash of M. So what we have is the hash of M. That's one value that B has determined. That's this value. The other value B has determined is the hash of MR. Let's look at that. The hash of MR, the hash of the message received, equals what? Well, the message received... Sorry, we need to scroll up. 
the message received was M prime, the modified message. Okay, so B received the modified message. He doesn't know it's modified, but we know that MR is the same as M prime because malicious user sent M prime with C, B receives that. So MR is really M prime. So hash of M prime. So they are the two values that B has, the hash of M and the hash of M prime. Is M prime the same as M? No. M prime is the modified message, M is the original message, they are different. Are the two hash values the same? No. If M and M prime are different, our property of the hash function is that the hash of those two different values should produce different hash values. So the result is that hash of M should not be equal to the hash of M prime. That is, the values that we compare are not the same. And that tells us don't trust this message. It's not authentic. That's the long way to go through. It's similar to what we did with the MAC function, but I've just used some different notation to try and show it from a different perspective. B receives, hashes the message received, decrypts the the part attached to that message, C in our case, and compares. And in this case, if we compare, we'll get two different hash values and therefore not trust. Why are they different values? Because we said it should be computationally infeasible if we use a cryptographic hash function, it should be practically impossible to have two messages that produce the same hash value. So we have two different messages, therefore we assume they will not produce the same hash value and therefore be different. Any questions? Is clear so far? Good. Any problems back here? Okay. So you see why this property is necessary. Because a successful attack would be if the malicious user could modify that message and it would go undetected. So what if the malicious user modified the message B receives, goes through the checks, what if the hash of M prime, if the hash of M prime did equal the hash of M, the hash of two messages were the same, then this attack would be successful. Okay, so that leads to this requirement that we must have a hash function where we can't find two messages with the same hash value. And that defines uh, the strength of hash functions. If a hash function has that property, uh, we'll see, we'll call it a, a, a collision resistant or a, or a strong hash function for cryptography. You can try other attacks. All right, that was modify the message. What else could you do? Try and modify the message. In this case, we didn't change C. We used the old value. Another attack would be modify the message and try and recalculate C. But to calculate C again, we take, remember, the procedure is the hash of the message encrypted with the shared secret key between A and B. But the malicious user doesn't have the secret key of the share between A and B, therefore could not create the correct encrypted hash value. It would be detected at the receiver again. 
So modifying the message and trying to modify this encrypted hash value will not work because of the keys. Okay. Any other attempts? Denial of service would be how? Sending many messages and getting to decrypt. Okay. Uh, well, right, I don't know if that's relevant here, but it raises an interesting practical point that calculating hash values is often, well, in some cases, can be quite slow. The algorithms can take a lot of effort. They often are designed to be slow. Okay, usually we design our algorithms to be fast. But we'll see later when we use hash functions, so it won't be in this topic, but later we'll look at passwords. And in that case, we want to make it hard for the attacker to calculate hashes quickly. So some hash functions are designed to be slow. But that's, that's the future. That's not, or that's a later lecture, not, not this topic. Okay. Let's look at another scenario. So that's our typical form of authentication using a hash function. It provides authentication that is B knows the message came from A. Because if it didn't verify correctly, then we can't trust who it comes from. If it verifies correctly, it must have been the hash value must have been encrypted with a shared secret key between A and B. Okay, so therefore if B receives a message and it's correct, it must have been created by A or B. And unless B sent the message to themselves, then that's proof that it came from A. So authentication of the source and integrity. If we try and modify the message along the way, it will be detected. That's how we provide integrity. Make sure the data is not modified. Okay. What's the next attack? The next one considers a different scenario of using a hash function, uh, and we'll look at what's possible to, for an attack. So Let's say we have this scheme. We send a message. So let's define the notation first. S is a secret shared between A and B. Okay? A has S, B knows S, no one else knows S in this case. This scheme, we don't use any encryption. There's no symmetric key or public key encryption. We take the secret combine it with the message and take a hash of the combined value and then combine that hash value in the message and send them. When B receives, B wants to authenticate. B wants to be sure this message came from A. So what B does is similar to before takes the receive message, but now combines it with a secret value it knows, and calculates the hash of that, and compares to the hash of the message. Sorry, the hash received. The idea here is that these two, to authenticate, don't need to use encryption. There's no encryption steps in here. Encryption is costly in terms of processing. So to avoid encryption, we're just using a hash function and combining a, the message with a secret, some secret value. Let's see what an attacker can do and see how this scheme provides authentication.
A sends a message to B. So A has a message. A also has a secret, and I'll denote it as SAB. Similar to a key, a shared secret key. But we, it's not used for encryption here, so we'll just call it a secret. So we calculate the hash of the message combined with the secret. And let's say we get H. And then we send them the message and the hash to B. So send the message with the hash value to B, and let's see if C, the or the malicious user in this case, can intercept. The malicious user wants to m modify the message. What do they do? Let's say they change the message, not the hash value. Okay, so the malicious user just does a modification attack in this case. M is changed to M prime, a different message. Send the same hash value. B receives and authenticates. And again, let's denote it as B receives MR combined with HR, the received values of what was sent. All right, and let's note it here. We know that MR equals M prime. B doesn't know that yet, okay? but we know because we can observe everything that's happening, and that HR equals H, the original H. Okay, that's... Uh, if we could observe everything that's happening, we'd know this. But of course, B doesn't observe what the modification is, is done here. So B doesn't know this, therefore needs to check. So it goes through the checking process. And back to our scheme. Take the message and the shared secret key, or the shared secret value, I should say. It's not a key, it's not used for encryption. Combines and hashes and then compares to the received hash. So B takes MR, combines it with the secret value shared between itself and the sender. The sender is A, or at least that's who B thinks sent, sent it, and calculates the hash. And what is that value? Well, note that MR, as we know, is M prime. So I'll write, instead of MR, M prime. So we have this value. And the second step is that we compare that with the hash value received. So we're going to compare that value, compare this, with the hash value received. What is the hash value received? HR. HR, which we know is H. Which, where did H come from? Hash of M and SAB. And now we compare those two values. That is, we, the hash of the received message combined with the secret compared with the hash value received. Do they match? Yes or no? 
let's have a test. Hands up, so you've got two options. No hands up means penalty in the next quiz. Two options, yes or no. When we compare these two green values, and don't worry, I'll remember who doesn't put their hand up. These two green values, when we compare them, are they the same? Hands up for yes. It's okay if you're wrong, you won't get a penalty. Hands up for no. I haven't seen some hands over here. What happens with no hands? Okay. I think everyone can see the hash. Why are they different? Why is it no? They're not the same because look at the contents or the input of the hash. Uh, I, I'll come back to how I got here, uh, but let's see why they're different. This is M prime combined with SAB. This is M combined with SAB. SAB, same, but M prime is different from M. We said that because that was the attack. Change M to M prime. Because M prime and M are different, it means the inputs to the hash function are different and our property from before. The hash of two different inputs produces two different hash values. So the outputs of these hash functions are different. So we compare them, they're different. And therefore B detects this attack. It knows something's gone wrong. Question? How do I know the message that's not modified? How do I know the... Uh, B does not know M. B received HR, HR. Okay. But we know... So B received HR. So what B does is compares HR with this. But what is the value of HR? We know HR is the same as H. Why do we know that? Because... M concatenated with H was sent, H was not modified, therefore what was received was the original H. Where did the original H come from? A calculated it from the hash of M and SAB. So B is not performing this calculation, we're just using it to show that these two values are different. Okay, so when you do compare them, they will be different. So we've defeated this attack. Give me another attack on this scheme. Change the hash. That is, change the message and the hash. Okay. Let's try. So we intercept and change not just the message, but also the hash value. Our malicious user. Sends M prime concatenated with, let's call it H prime. Where H prime is what? Mr. Attacker, tell me what H prime is. No. How do we calculate H prime? The hash of what? Hash of message prime concatenated with your own secret. S mal. S of malicious user. We're supposed to calc concatenate the message and the secret shared between the two users. But of course, the malicious user doesn't know S, A, B. We've, we've modified the message, yes. So, we've, so I'm the malicious user. I change the message to whatever I like. And now I try to recalculate the hash. I can. I take the, the new message, combine it with some secret value, I wrote S mal because we know it's not SAB because that's a secret only A and B know. 
and I get H prime and send that to B. And it comes to B. And we'll denote what's received again as the received values as MR concatenated with HR. That is, that's what B receives, the values. We know as this uh, oracle that can see everything that's happening, we know that what is MR? What was sent to be M prime. MR is actually M prime. HR, the received value, is H prime. Okay, so let's go and continue for the verification. We Step one, we calculate the hash of the received message combined with the secret key shared between A and B, the secret value, sorry, SAB. And we know MR is in fact M prime. So that is equal to the hash of M prime concatenated with SAB. There's our first value. The next step that B takes is they compare that value to the hash received. All right. What is the hash received? HR which we know is the same as H prime. Where did H prime come from? Our malicious user, our attacker, calculated it as given by this equation. It's the hash of M prime and S, the secret value of not AB, mal. B compares the values. Again, I think you'll see they're not the same because the inputs to the two hash functions are different. Therefore, the hash values as output will be different. We compare them. They're not the same. We detected his attack. So, how do the attacker know the hash function? The hash function is known. Okay, we assume the function, the algorithm, is known. The same as we assume the encryption algorithms are known. We assume the algorithms used in all of this are known. Uh, let's say they're using some software. So this is all done in software. A and B are using some software, some email client. And it's known that that software uses this hash function. So the attacker knows the hash function. Different values, don't trust. Malicious, next attack, anything? Sorry? Crack the SAB. Crack, crack SAB. If you know SAB, if malicious user knew SAB here, they wouldn't have used SMAL, they would have used SAB, and we would have got to hash of M prime with SAB compared to the hash of M prime and SAB, they would have been the same and the attack would have been successful. So it's about keeping SAB secret. Okay. Same with the encryption. Yeah, keys must be kept secret. If not, they're not called secret keys. But how can you find SAB? How could the malicious user find SAB? Brute force. What about trying to go backwards from the hash value? So if we have SAB, this would be a successful attack by the malicious user. How do we find SAB? Well, an approach would be, so this is the malicious user. 
what do they know? The malicious user knows M, so that's known to the malicious user. M, H, because they received M and H. Okay. They know the hash function. So look at, they want to find SAB. If they can, they can do an authentication attack. So how do they find SAB apart from guessing? Well, one approach, note what is H? H is hash of M concatenated with SAB. That's what lowercase h is. Now, what do we know? We know the hash value, we know m, we know the hash function, we want to find SAB. What do we need to do? We need to calculate the inverse of this hash function. We know the output. If we knew the input, it'd be easy to find SAB because SAB is just the, the difference of the, the input and the message M, which is also known. So to find SAB, if the attacker can do the inverse of the hash function, what would they find? That is, if the attacker could calculate, I'll write it as h, the inverse function of lowercase h, what's the answer? So when lowercase h is the hash value, if we could do the inverse function of that, the answer would be the original input, which would be m sab. If we, if the attacker now knows m sab, they know m, so sab is easy to find because let's say m sab is 1,100 bits in length. 1,100 bits. If we know m and m is a thousand bits, it means sab is the last 100 bits. It's just concatenation. It's just one combined with the other. So if we know the full part, and we know one part of it, then we know the other part of it. So, if we know M concatenated with SAB, and we know M, finding SAB is d direct from here. So we'd find the secret. So this depends on being able to calculate the inverse of the hash function. That is, given the hash value, go backwards and get the original input. Can we do that? No. Well, if we have a cryptographically strong hash function, we've said a property is, it's practically impossible uh, to, to go backwards. That is, that given a known h value, so if you know h, to find an m. So it's practically possible, given a known h, to find m. That is, to go backwards to do the inverse function. So that's why we need the one-way property here. If we didn't have a hash function with this one-way property, and we used it in this authentication scheme, the attack would have been successful. Questions on hash functions so far? Everyone's quiet means everyone understands. Is that a safe assumption? Or everyone's listening to music on their headphones? Question? Is that a question? That two questions? Or is that a yawn? Okay. <laughs> Disappointed.
So this scheme here was performed authentication, but without the overhead of encrypting data, which can be quite slow sometimes. So it's one way to do authentication. And we saw some attacks and see why they are un unsuccessful, why they were detected. And also, it demonstrates this requirement for the one-way property. This one is uh, similar, but now we use encryption as well. So you see it's a combination of take our secret and the hash of that, but instead of sending that, to make sure everything's secret, confidential, send using symmetric key encryption of all of those values. So th the previous one, everyone can see the message. No confidentiality. But if we also want confidentiality, then we can get that as in this approach. This slide demonstrates that I've reversed the order of the topics. In fact, in the past, you covered hash before mash, MAC functions. Uh, I think we've said it several times before, using encryption we want to avoid sometimes because it's slow, it has some costs involved with it. So having an authentication scheme that doesn't rely on encrypting the entire message is useful. And MAC functions and hash functions can be used for that. MAC functions we mentioned in the previous topic. Note, what's the difference between a MAC and a hash function? If we look at the concept, Let's write them down. Our hash function, and from the previous topic, a MAC function, what do we do? A tag was the MAC of using a key, a shared secret key, and a message. But we use them for similar purposes. Sometimes a MAC function is called a keyed hash function. Sometimes we implement the MAC using a hash function, but introducing also a key. Because we use it for the same purposes, very similar, uh, except a MAC also takes as a key as an input. If you look at the last few slides of the previous topic, MAC, the MAC function, you'll see there's a one called HMAC, hashed MAC, which is a MAC function but uses a hash function. So it's just a way to combine a known hash function and a key as an input. The reason for that is that hash functions, there are many, uh, or there are several well known hash functions. And the properties and the performance of them uh, are known, and the security is uh, the software is available to implement them. So in some cases it makes sense. Don't develop a new MAC function, just use an existing hash function, but introduce a key as well. And HMAC does that. HMAC was on the last few slides of the previous topic. I will not go back to it. Let's look at, let's introduce digital signatures now. So on this topic, we'll look at digital signatures. Then we'll come back and look at our properties of collision-free and one-way property, but that will be next lecture. And then, actually before digital signatures, a quick example of some hash functions. Uh, MD5 and SHA are two hash functions. Let's show you. We're not going to go into the details of any hash functions, the algorithms and how they implemented. I'll just show you some examples.
to set it up so it will work easy. I think we mentioned before, so we have a plain text message. Actually, this is the wrong example. We have a plain we have an input message. Plain text.txt, we showed before, this is our message that we want to send. We calculate this, the hash of that. MD5 is a hash algorithm, a hash function. So that's one hash function, which is quite popular. MD5 sum is just a program to calculate it for us on, on a Linux. So it takes as an input the, the uh, input message and returns the hash value. MD5 produces a 128-bit hash value. So, represented here as, uh, what, 32 hexadecimal digits. So, four bits per hexadecimal digit. There are 128 bits there. And it looks random. That's the requirement of hash functions. You hash an input message, the output hash value should be have random properties. Okay? It appears as a pseudo-random number. If you hash another message, you should get a, another random hash value as an output. So if we change our message, actually copy it, I'll copy it and now change the message. Just change a letter and now calculate the MD5 sum of that modified message. Here's the MD5 sum of plain text.txt 91D2 and the MD5 sum of mo the modified message B64. Okay, so you see the hash values are completely different. That's what we desire for our hash function. Random looking hash values, even if the input messages are similar. Uh, so we said with two different input messages we should get two different hash values. Another example we've got from before. I've got two files. There are 128 bits in 128 bytes in length. So file and file 2.txt 128 bytes in length. Are the files the same? Uh, there are some binary files. So we're not opening it in a text editor. Let's open in a hex editor. Are these two files the same? Who can see? So just two binary files, file.txt and file2.txt. Are they the same? It's hard, it's not obvious. Or is there a difference somewhere? Remember, this is a hex editor, these are the hex values, these are the hex values converted to ASCII. It's a dot if there's no printable ASCII character. They are different. There are several differences, I think. One of them I can see uh, look at this fourth row going backwards B, 5, C, 3, 7, 3, 0, 8 all the same 2, uh, F and 7 okay, so there's a difference there and I think there are a few others around there there are 6 or 7 I think there are 6 or 7 bits that are different if you look at the binary so there is a few small differences in these files but just a few bits different so when we do the MD5 sum of the first one, we get this. And the MD5 sum of the second one, again, what are we going to get? Are we going to get a hash value which is the same, different, or similar? Same, 
close or completely different? We, don't, we hope it's completely different. The hash of two similar messages should produce two completely different hash values. Uh oh. It's the same hash value. What went wrong? What went wrong is that MD5 is not considered cryptographically secure. No longer, at least. With MD5, with that as a hash function, it's possible, and people have found messages, two different messages, that produce the same hash value. Here's an example. Two different messages, but they produce the same hash value. Now, of course, these messages are not in English, and they're just created to demonstrate that they produce the same hash value. In practice, an attacker usually needs to find two different messages which make sense that produce the same hash value, which is much harder. But still, nowadays, for security, MD5 is considered insecure. It's a hash function, but it no long, where it doesn't have this property that it's practically impossible to find two messages with the same hash value. People have found collisions with MD5, and it's not so hard to now. In the past, MD5 was considered secure, but today it's not recommended for security applications. A new algorithm is SHA, the secure hash algorithm. And there's the SHA sum, I think. SHA-SUM is a program that uses a different hash algorithm called SHA, the secure hash algorithm. And if we apply SHA-SUM on both files, two different files on input, SHA-SUM returns two different hash values. So SHA is considered cryptographically secure. So it's a better algorithm than MD5. With MD5, this specific example produces the same hash value, but the same files produce different SHA hash values. This form of SHA produces a 160-bit hash value. There are other variations with 256 bits, 512 bits, which are even more secure. So we desire this collision-free property, but not all hash algorithms have that collision-free property. So we need to choose one that's, that does have the property to be secure. Let's go back to one of our schemes we went through. This scheme. Yeah, this scheme. We went through this scheme. We take the hash of the message, encrypt with the key, the key that's shared between A and B, and we can verify at receiver B. Which means when B verifies, B knows that this message hasn't been modified and the message came from A. Okay? So authentication is proving that the message came from a particular sender. What's a signature? Define a signature. When you sign your name on a piece of paper, what's the intention? Uh, verification that the paper is authentic, the, me the message on that paper is authentic. And verification to who? When you sign a piece of paper, what's the purpose? If there's a message on the paper, you're trying to make sure that when anyone sees that paper, they know it came from you. Okay, so your signature, when someone has a piece of paper with your signature on it, the idea is that that other person who has that piece of paper is sure that that was, came from you. 
Okay? So that's the signature. If we try and implement a similar mechanism using hash functions and symmetric key encryption, we could think, OK, here's our message. We take a small representation of that message, the hash of that message, and sign it, well, not sign it, and encrypt it with a shared secret key. We could think, this part is the signature, this is the message. Okay, so you have a message and you sign the bottom. So you can split between message and signature. So think of the same concept here. We have a message and a signature, where the signature is the encrypted hash of that message. Now, someone receives this. They receive M and the encrypted hash, the message and the signature. The idea of a signature is that we can verify later that this message came from A. Can B verify that this message came from A? Does, when B receives this message, does it know it came from A? Yes, that's our, our verification here. That is, B receives it, it does the check, and it confirms this message came from A. But with a signature, we'd like to be able to allow anyone to verify the message. So when I sign something, I'd like to be able to give it to all of you, and all of you could verify it came from me. Not just one person, so I don't just send it to one, but a signed document, everyone knows it came from me. So let's say there was a, another user, C. Not a malicious user, just another normal user. And C wants to verify the message came from A. How does C do that? Can C verify a message came from A? How would C... So this message was signed and sent to B. But then the, the signed message is also made available to A with the intention that A needs to verify. This message came from A. How does C do that? How could C do that? Or what would they need to know to do that? Any ideas? Are oh, you too smart? Uh, how we would do it with this scheme? Yes, use public key and private key, but we're using symmetric key. It's possible, but under certain unrealistic conditions, we'll see. So if C needs to verify this, that is, there's a message sent to B, and then later C needs to make sure it came from A. Well, first thing, they would need to know the key. They would need to know KAB. Okay? Because it was encrypted with KAB, and to verify, we must have KAB. So there's a, the first step, but it's a problem because for C to verify this message, C needs to know the secret shared between A and B. So imagine we need to somehow exchange messages between users and there's another entity that needs to verify who sent those messages. That's what we're trying to achieve. For C to verify this message came from A, it would need to know KAB, which defeats our purpose of a shared secret between A and B if C also knows it. So there's a problem if we want to use this scheme as a signature. What's the second problem? What else stops us from using this to implement our signature? Let's say C does know KAB. Okay, let's assume it does. So they have a message. I'll give you the message that you are user C and
This is the value that you have. And think of this part as the signature. You have this. Okay? And you need to confirm that this message came from A. Okay? That's your, your task. And let's say, to make it easy, you also know KAB. Okay, those two users, A and B, they trust you with their key, so they give you your, their key. So now your job is to confirm that this, this message, has been signed by user A. How do you do that? Or can you do that? Decrypt. Okay, so as this user C, if I know K, A, B, I can decrypt. So, I will not write it down, the steps, but if I know KAB, of course I can decrypt this, I'll get the hash of M, compare this hash with the hash of the message, if they're the same, assume they're authentic. Does that confirm that this message came from A? No, it doesn't. It's either A or B. And that's the point I'm trying to get to. If we use symmetric key encryption, we can use it for authentication, but this idea of a signature, a signature is that this message came from one person in the world. If we use symmetric key encryption, the best that we can do, if we knew this key, would be confirmed that this message came from A or B. Why? Because A could have created this, because A knows the message, they know the hash of the message, they know KAB, or B could have created this. They know all of that as well. So this could have come from A or B. Therefore, some third party cannot verify which is the original sender. Is it A or B? We don't know. There's no way to be sure. And therefore, using symmetric key encryption cannot be used for a signature. So I called it a signature, it's not. If we try to use this for a signature, it won't work. Because the best we can do is confirm it came from two users in the world, but a signature should be unique to one user. So, as was suggested before, for a real signature in or a digital signature, we don't use symmetric key encryption, we use public key encryption. Okay, so we move away from symmetric key encryption and move to using public key encryption for a signature. And that's what we're going to cover on Thursday. So we'll look and go through digital signatures, see what they are, how, they, how something is signed, how, how a signed document is verified and see the role of public key encryption and hash functions in that. Let's stop there and we'll continue that on Thursday.